So welcome to the fifth tutorial on CROC 1 2015 booklet. So a patient has been given atropine, atropine sulfate for rapid relief of spas, spastic colon symptoms. The use of this drug is contraindicated during the following disease. It's contraindicated during the following disease. You know uh, the function of atropine sulfate. We've discussed it in pharmacology. And we said uh, atropine sulfate is M cholinoreceptor blockage or it blocks M cholinoreceptors. It blocks M cholinoreceptors. And one of the side effects of atropine sulfate is to increase intra eye pressure. It to increase intra eye pressure or increase pressure in the eyes. That is one of the complications of atropine uh, sulfate. So in this case, what is the contra, what will be contraindicated if you are giving this drug? And of course, your answer should be what? Glaucoma. Because glaucoma simply means that there is increase in intraocular pressure. So if there's increase in intraocular pressure and you continue to give atropine sulfate, you're going to cause more harm than good. More harm than good. So, of course, if you have glaucoma, never give. I mean, if the patient has glaucoma, never give atropine sulfate. So your answer is C. As an, as an example of a specific human parasite, specific human parasite, one can name Plasmodium falciparum, human pink worm, and some others. The source of parasite invasion in these cases is always a human. Okay. Such specific human parasites cause the disease that are called, in other words, uh, the transmission of what? Uh, infection from human to human is called what? It's called anthroponosis. 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 And of course, a disease that is transmitted from animals to humans is called zoonotic. 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 Or anthropozoonosis. Anthropozoonosis. So you have to know the difference between some of uh, these things. So over here, what are we talking about? We are talking about what? Specific uh, human parasite. Specific human parasite. Specific human parasite. And of course, we are talking about what? About human to human. So that answer is what? Anthroponosis. Anthroponosis. So your answer is A. A. Now, in the course of an experiment, there has been increase in nerve conduction velocity. That means there's increase in what? Excitation. Now, this may be caused by an increase in concentration of the following ions that are present in the solution around the cell. Around the cell. So if you have a cell, so this is the cell. This is the outside, isn't it? This is the outside of the cell. This is the inside of the cell. So the question now is that what ions are predominant inside the cell? Who can tell me? What ions are predominant inside the cell? Who can tell me? Inside. Sodium. Sodium. So Sodium. inside the cell, what ions inside? Potassium. They say, ah, potassium. 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 Yes. And outside the cell, we have what? The sodium. Don't forget, outside the cell is sodium. Inside the cell is potassium. Even though potassium are positively charged, but it's considered as what? Negative. Because so it will make the cell, uh, how do you call it? Uh, that's what helps the cell to maintain this, uh, how do you call it? Um, uh, action potential membrane. I mean, without any action potential happening. But as soon as action potential is, action potential is about to happen, it means that there will be movement of what? Potassium from outside the cell into the cell, thereby increasing what the action potential, causing what we call depolarization. By now you should know some of these things I'm talking about, okay? So, like I said, so inside the cell is more of what potassium and outside the cell is more of what sodium. And the question is that there's an increase in concentration of ions that are present in the solution around the cell. 
So that what it means is that sodium are around the cell, but they are now present inside the cell, and that's why there's what excitation, or there's increase in nerve force conduction. All right. So that's over here. Your answer would definitely be what would be potassium instead of sorry, would be sodium. Would be sodium instead of you. Some of you thinking of potassium to be what uh, sodium ions. Sodium ions. All right. An HIV patient, positive patient, cause of death is acute pulmonary insufficiency resulting from pneumonia. Resulting from pneumonia. Pathohistological investigation of the lungs has revealed interstitial pneumonia, alveolocyte disquamation, and metamorphosis. Alveolocyte enlargement is the large intranuclear int inclusion surrounded by light colored areas. Now, this is your clue. There are transformed cells that resemble the oil's eye, oil's eye. And this description is very, very, very specific for what? Cytomegalovirus. Cytomegalovirus. And all of these things are all what? Opportunistic sort of what? Infection. Opportunistic sort of what? Infection. And if you have HIV, your immune system is automatically what down and any sort of infection can affect you. But then again, with the description of oil's eye tells us that this is specific for what? For cytomegalovirus or, yeah, cytomegalovirus. This is E. E will be your answer. All right. The organisms to be identified, the organisms to be identified have a nucleus surrounded by a nuclear membrane. That's a second. Let me send some link to some people. Just a second. Second. Uh, okay. Now, genetic material is concentrated predominantly in the chromosomes that consist of DNA strands and protein molecules. DNA strands and protein molecules. These cells divide mitotically, identify these organisms, identify these organisms. So in other words, which of these organisms contains DNA strands? Contains what? DNA strands. And of course, you are uh, definitely thinking of what? Uh, eukaryotes, 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 eukaryotes. So that's what you should be what looking at for eukaryotic cells, eukaryotic cells, because these cells have what a nucleus that is enclosed within membranes. It has nucleus enclosed within what membranes, unlike the prokaryotes, like the bacteria, and so therefore, and and the rest they don't have it. They don't have this kind of what things. And again, uh, they also contain what a membrane-bound what organelles. Eukaryote contains membrane-bound what organelles and Golgi apparatus. All of these things are found in eukaryotic what cells. But the rest, unfortunately, they don't. All right. So the answer here is what should be E. The answer here should be E. All right. A two-year-old boy is diagnosed with Down syndrome. A two-year-old boy is diagnosed with Down syndrome. Down syndrome. What chromosomal changes may, may be the cause of this disease? Again, we've talked about these things in our bi biology tutorials. We'll talk about these things in our biology tutorials. So nothing to confuse us. So basically, if you are talking about uh, trisomy 21, of course, that is what Down syndrome. Trisomy 21 is what Down syndrome. Trisomy 18 is what is Edwards. Edwards. 13 is what Patau. 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 Then Monosomy X. Who can tell me the last time we talk about this? Who can tell me this? This Monosomy X. Tena. Good. That is what Tena syndrome. Very good. That is what Tena. Syndrome and trisomy X is what, of course, trisomy X. 
Trust me, X is trust me, X, definitely. So that means if I have what? X, 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 X. That's trust me, X. All right, so here you are talking about what? Trust me, 21, because it's Down syndrome. Down syndrome. All right. After a road traffic accident, after a road accident, a victim has tachycardia, arterial blood pressure, 130, 190. Tachypnea, the skin is pale and dry. Excitation of the central nervous system is observed. Excitation is observed. The shock stage is in this patient, most likely. The shock stage is... Hey, what kind of English is this? Anyways, it's war. But I think what they are trying to ask us is that what stage of shock is this person in? What stage of shock is this person in? So you can write this down if I were you. So for any shock, it is characterized into two phases. Shock is characterized into what? Into two uh, phase change of the central nervous system. With regard to the central nervous system, there are two changes. We have one. We have one. The, the erectile stage. The erectile stage. Erectile stage, which is the initial spread of excitation of the neurons. Initial excitation of the neurons is called the erectile stage. Then we have in the future, we have in the future, also known as what? The tepid stage, tepid stage, tepid stage. That is what in the future, where there's a widespread oppression of the neurons activity. So first of all, there is what excitation at the initial stages. Then when it continues to go on, when there's now no uh, blood to that tissue and things like that, what happens is that there will be what? There will be, how do you call it? Uh, the tepid stage, decreased activity of the neurons. Imagine your brain cells are devoid of blood. Shock, I mean, stroke can develop, isn't it? Exactly, that's because there's insufficient supply of blood to that tissue. So it develops into the tepid what stage. So over here, since we're talking about excitation and things like that, we are doing what the erectile stage, the erectile stage, and that's what over here your answer should be a, the erectile stage. All right. As a result of a mechanical injury, an over ten centimeter long portion of the peripheral nerve was damaged. The peripheral nerve was damaged. Okay. Now, this, this caused an impairment of the upper limb activity. The patient was offered nerve transplantation. What glial cells will participate in the regeneration and provide the trophism of the injured limb? So what glial cells will participate in regeneration? So what cells are involved in regeneration of the peripheral nerve cells? And of course, you are thinking of what? The swan cells, swan cells, swan cells, swan cells. These are the things, that, I mean, these cells are the ones that differentiate, they differentiate and undergo proliferation and help us to build what? A strong nervous what? system. So in this case that it was damaged, we have to, so they are more or less like the stem cells, okay? They are more or less like the stem cells, just like in the blood, we have what? The stem cells, that is the multipotent, uh, stem cells where they help in the regeneration of what of blood cells from the red blood cells to the white blood cells and then to the lymphoid system all of those things are all there so in neurons we call them the swan cells the swan cells so your answer here is what is a your answer here is a all right a 47 year old Man developed intestinal colic, intestinal colic against the background of essential hypertension. Now, in this situation, it would be the most efficient to arrest the colic by administrating administering drugs of the following what groups, drugs of the following groups. So there is spasm because it's what intestinal colic against the background of essential what hypertension. So now that there is a kind of spasm or intestinal colic, what happens is that you will want to give what to call what? An antispasm drug. 
because there's spasm intestinal colic means there's spasm in the intestine okay so if you want to give so you will want to give what a drug that is against spasm and what drug is it of course even if you don't know that the answer even is telling you a straight for this what a myotropic antispasmodic a myotropic anti spasmodic what drug this is the drug that you're going to administer to help the person stop these spasms so sometimes when patient come to us with stomach pains that means there's intestinal colic stomach pains i mean intestinal pains and things like that or abdominal pains we give them what nospa some of you might have heard it before nospa nospa is an example of what anti spasmodic nospa some of you might have heard it before nospa nospa no spa. All right. So your answer here is what is D antispasmodic. Uh, a microscopy. Of a female patient swaps made from a vagina secretion revealed a gram negative bean shaped. We've talked about this like million times in my, our microbiology presentations. Bean shaped diplococci. What provisional diagnosis can this be made of? Who can tell me? What is your answer? Gonorrhea. 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 Exactly. Exactly. Gono. Gonorrhea. So your answer here is what? Is uh, C. Bean shaped. Bean shaped. That's your clue. Bean shaped. And of course, it's also what? Gram negative gram negative all right <clears throat> so what do we have now a 54 year old man woman was brought to a casualty department after a car accident after a car accident a traumatologist diagnosed her with multiple fractures of the lower extremities. What kind of embolism is most likely to develop? I believe we discuss um, types of embolism over here. We have the gas embolism. We have the air embolism. We have the fat embolism. I believe we've discussed it over here. Now, if, if, if now when we say embolism, embolism simply means the movement of a substance in the bloodstream movement of a substance in the blood stream and this movement can go and lodge somewhere in the heart sorry yeah somewhere in the heart somewhere in the lungs it can go and lodge in there and when it lodges in there it can cause what problems isn't it and some of the embolos we can identify include thrombos now in thrombos is when we have a problem with bleeding okay so people suffering from deep vein thrombosis, deep vein thrombosis, DVT, some of you might have heard it before, DVT. This is when there is inflammation inside the deep veins in the legs or in the lower extremities. Now, you know, anytime there is bleeding or there is inflammation, things like that, thrombos can form, which is more or less like clotting inside the vessel. Now, these clots can break and then dislodge from its origin and then it can move in the bloodstream, that is what embolism, but because it is made up of what a clot or a thrombos, we call it what thromboembolism. Uh huh, thromboembolism. Now, people who dive or people who you know high altitude and things like that will be dealing with what uh, air embolism, air embolism, air embolism. Now, in places where we have breaking of uh, bones, okay, bones dislodging from the place and going to uh, block some places or move in the bloodstream. We call it what? We call it fat embolus, fat embolus, also known as what? Adipose embolus. Fat means adipose. So we have what we call what? adipose with embolus. So in this case, we have what? Multiple fractures, multiple fractures. So pieces of the bones can break and they can go and pass through the bloodstream and block some important organs in our body, like the lungs, like the lungs. So over here, we are looking at what? Adipose. I've taken my time to, I, I believe we have talked about this, but I've forgotten myself, but I think we have done, it, we have done this. So I've thrown more light on it for you. So never get a question wrong on embolism. 
So here your answer is what is D. So let me just ask a question. So in case of deep vein thrombosis, what can we have? What type of embolism can we have? Adipose. Deep vein thrombosis. In terms of deep vein yeah. thrombosis. Hey. Hey. Exactly. You can Gosh. talk about thrombus. Uh-huh. Thromboembolism, please. Thromboembolism. In fractures, in bones, you are dealing with what? Adipose. Adipose. Good. Mm -hmm. A therapist has an appointment with a 40-year-old patient complaining of recurrent pain attacks in his hilux joint and their swelling. Urine analysis revealed it marked acid acidity and pain color. What substance can cause such changes in urine? Guys, they've told you that there's pain in the joint. Pain in the joint. <laughs> And I think urine analysis is revealing a lot of what? Acidity and pain color. Pain color. Before I continue, what diagnosis is this? Who can tell me? Of course. Gout. gout. Thank you. You guys are too much. This is what? Gout. And in gout, we have high concentration of what? Uric acid in the blood. And this is what is causing the pain. Their accumulation in the joint is what is causing the pain attacks is what is causing the pain attacks. So, of course, in analysis, you will see that because of the presence of the uric acid, we are having this kind of color, this uh, pink color and with acidity because, of course, uric acid is acid. So, acidity will be there, definitely. So, over here, you're looking at what? Uric acid. Uric acid. So, your answer here should be what? Should be B. Should be B. And again, which... Uh, how do I put it? How do I put it? Which product is it coming from? Is it coming from the purines or the pyrimidines? Which nuclear acid is it coming from? Purines. Who can tell me? Come again. Purines. 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 Exactly. Purines. We've talked about this like a million times, so you should know this. A 30-year-old woman with diabetes mellitus type 1 was hospitalized. Diabetes mellitus type 1. Now, the patient is comatose. That means in coma. Laboratory tests revealed hyperglycemia and ketonemia. Ketonemia. What metabolic disorder can be detected in this patient? There's ketonemia. Is ketone bodies, do ketones produce acid or they produce bases? Who can tell me? Acid. 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 Exactly. They end up producing what? Uh, acid. So what it means is that, now this is what diabetes mellitus, glucose metabolism, glucose metabolism. So therefore, we are having a metabolic what, changes and this metabolic changes is leading to what? Acidosis. And so therefore, your answer is what? Metabolic acidosis. Again, we have discussed what excretory acidosis is, excretory uh, alkalosis is, and all those and even we discuss respiration, respiration acidosis, respiration alkalosis. We said in hyperventilation, what do we get? We said in uh, a hypoventilation, what do we get? Please, all of these things, we have discussed them in the path, morpholo I mean, path physiology and physiology tutorial. So please, 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 please do yourself the favor and watch those videos. All right. So just a, a, a lot of revision. If somebody is vomiting, what kind of acidosis, I mean, what kind of uh, acid base balance will we have? Vomiting. Metabolic acidosis. Oh, you are good. What about diarrhea? Metabolic acidosis. Oh, you are too much. It means you have been following all my nonsense. That's good. <laughs> A 15 year old patient has fasting blood glucose to be 4.8, one hour after glucose challenge, it becomes nine in two hours, seven. Okay. Now in three hours, it went back to what? 4.8, such parameters are characteristic for this person is what? Uh, uh, I mean, what is it characteristic of? What is this thing characteristic of? So, uh, how do you call it? So you're saying the glucose, I mean, fasting glucose is 4.8. Fasting glucose is 4.8. And normally, let me just give you a summary of what this whole thing is. Okay. So normally, 
uh, a blood sugar level supposed, supposed to be less than 7.8 millimole per liter, of course. 7.8 millimole per is supposed to be less than this reading. Now, if you have a reading more than 11.1, of course, it's indicative of what? Of diabetes. It's indicative of what? Of diabetes mellitus. Now, a reading between 7.8 and 11 indicates what? Pre-diabetes. It indicates pre-diabetes. So now look at this patient. This patient is having what? 4.8. Uh, in three hours, there's 4.8. This means that the patient is actually what? Okay, if you ask me. Isn't it? Patient is actually what? Okay. Patient is okay. Uh, don't forget that the moment you eat glucose, your glucose level will automatically increase within the first one hour because you are eating glucose. But after two hours, three hours, it should come down because the tissue will have utilized the glucose. So it's what it should reduce. So this person should actually be healthy. It should actually be a healthy person, not a subclinical diabetes mellitus. In subclinical diabetes mellitus, it means that you are between 7 and 11. That is subclinical. You are not yet diabetic. Neither are you uh, non-diabetic. It means that you are getting closer to what diabetes. That is subclinical. But this person is automatically what healthy. That's why I disagree with Croc. I disagree with Croc. But this is, and I think we've had a simpler, uh, a similar question before. But this is what a healthy person. It's a healthy person. So it's over to you. But this is a healthy person. A healthy person. All right. A patient has undergone a surgical removal of the cavitary liver lesion. Cavitary liver lesion. Two centimeters in diameter. It was revealed that the cavity wall was formed by a dense fibrous connective tissue. The cavity contained uh, murky, thick, yellowish green fluid with an unpleasant odor. Unpleasant odor. Unpleasant odor. Microscopically, the fluid consisted mainly of polymo polymorphonuclear leukocyte. Again, you know what you're thinking about. What pathological process are these morphology changes typical of? Of course, you are thinking of what? Uh, for the yellow-greenish fluid, tells you that there's some sort of what? Uh, how do you call it? Purulent or Superative infection going on. Superative sort of what? Infection going on in this patient. That is happening in this patient. All right. And again, they've told you that there are what? Polymorphous new leukocyte. That's tell you that we are having the neutrophils and, and so on present. And again, that shows that it is a sign of what? An infection. It's a sign of what? And infection. But so over here, we are going to go in for what? For a chronic abscess. Chronic abscess. Now, chronic abscess because of the presence of a dense fibrous connective tissue. That means that this thing has been there for quite a long time. Okay, so it's chronic. Now the tissues are being replaced with a fibrous connective or tissue. Now, in acute, you will not see a fibrous connective tissue present. So please take note of that. Take note of it. So that is what is differentiating, differentiating between the acute and the chronic abscess. In chronic, there is the formation of a fibrous connective tissue. And in acute, it is none. I mean, there is none. There is none. All right. Since I see, a patient consulted a physician about his chest pain, cough, fever, X-ray of the lungs revealed eosinophilic infiltrate, which were formed, which were found to contain the lava. What kind of helminthiasis are these presentation typical of? What are they typical of? Of course, you now the question that which one of them have the ability to have this sort of what eosinophilic infiltrate, eosinophilic infiltrate, and this brings my mind to. My medical app that is on Play Store at the moment. 
I've given you guys some mnemonics that can help you identify some few microorganisms. And this isnophilic infiltrate is one of them. And anytime you see isnophilic infiltrate, and of course, they are talking about what, the type of element or runworm. Definitely what comes to mind is what? It's Ascaris lumbricoides. Ascaris lumbricoides. And again, we've discussed this in microbiology base. So please do well to watch it. Do well to watch it. And these Ascariasis can cause damage in intestine. I mean, intestinal or visceral damages. It can cause peritonitis. It can cause enlargement of the liver, enlargement of the spleen. It goes almost every single place. It goes in almost every single place. And sometimes they will not use isnophilic infiltrate. They will use what we call a lofula syndrome. Lofula syndrome. Lofula syndrome. Which a lofula syndrome simply means that a disease in which isnophils accumulate in the lungs. So please write it down. Lofula syndrome. L O E F F L E R. Lofula syndrome. Syndrome. It means a disease where we have accumulation of what is nofils in the lungs. So your answer here is what? It's ascariasis. During appendectomy, a patient had the artery appendicularis ligated. The vessel branches from the following artery. So over here, you need to know your anatomy. You need to know your anatomy. So the question now is that where is this appendicular uh, artery coming from? Coming from, or what does it give rise to? Basically, that's what it's talk, it talking about. And over here, we're going to look at what, what we call what? Sorry. We're looking at what we call what? Iliocolic artery. The iliocolic artery iliocolic artery iliocolic artery and this is the lowest branch arising from the superior mesenteric what, artery but let me tell you how it runs through the body so basically it passes downwards and to the right behind the peritoneum toward the right iliac fossa and we know in the right iliac fossa we have the what the cecum isn't it we have the appendix present so again that should be drawing your mind towards those areas and again this uh, artery will now divide into superior and inferior branch the inferior branch gives rise to the appendicular artery the inferior branch gives rise to the appendicular artery aha uh -huh. it gives rise to the appendicular artery. but again we can't say we're going to for the what the inferior mesenteric artery because this inferior mesenteric artery is coming from the iliocolic artery. So this is the parent artery. This is the parent artery which gives branch to this, and this inferior will now give branch to this appendicular what, artery. Again, it is best to see this with a diagram, but unfortunately, I don't have it on my presentation. So. Let's do our possible to get that. So, of course, my assistant will do that for us. You know yourself. You know yourself. So don't let, don't let me mention your name. You know yourself. So please put this artery inside the group page for us, okay? For Stina, I've mentioned your name okay. eventually. <laughs> All right. A 28-year-old patient undergoing treatment in the pulmonological department has been diagnosed with a pulmonary emphysema caused by the splitting of alveolar septum by a tissular trepsin. The disease is caused by the congenital deficiency of the following enzyme, the following enzyme. So again, what is emphysema? Emphysema is a long-term progressive disease of the lungs that primarily causes shortness of breath due to overinflation of the alveoli over inflation of the alveoli. That means that the lungs is scarring. The lungs are what are scarring. And there are a lot of what problems taking, I mean, going on in the lungs. And usually, one thing that helps the lungs in terms of 
recoiling and all those kind of things is the action of what we call alpha one, alpha one uh, proteinase, alpha one proteinase, alpha one. We also call it alpha one antitrypsin, alpha one antitrypsin, alpha one antitrypsin. So. When there's a deficiency of these enzymes or these substances, what means is that it can lead to what? To emphysema formation. It can lead to emphysema formation. And usually what can lead or what can cause that is a person who likes smoking. So people who like to smoke, they destroy these uh, proteinases. They, deny, they, they destroy them. They destroy them. And these can lead to deficiency of these what enzyme deficiency of these enzymes all right so over here we are going to look at what at a a as our answer all right a patient who has been suffering for a long time from intestine dysbacteriosis has increased hemorrhaging caused by disruption of post-translational modification of blood coagulation factors. Blood coagulation factors. Guys, I think those who have been following me on my WhatsApp, I asked a question that which vitamin is involved in coagulation? Who can tell me? Which vitamin? Vitamin K. Vitamin K. Vitamin K. Vitamin K. Oh, exactly. You are correct. Vitamin K is involved in what? In coagulation is involved in coagulation. So your answer here is what is C. White vitamin deficiency is the cause. And again, your answer is what? Vitamin K. All right. During a surgery of the femoral hernia, a surgeon operates within the boundaries of the femoral trigone. What structure makes up its upper margin? Its upper margin. Margins. If I were you, I will write this down. So let's talk about the boundaries of the femoral triangle. Of course, femoral trigon or femoral triangle. Let's talk about the boundaries. Now, superiorly, we have the inguinal ligament. Superiorly, we have the inguinal ligament. Medially, we have the medial border of the adductor longus muscle. Abduct adductor add adductor longus muscles that is occurring what medially media so here is the what the the media border of the adductor longus muscles then laterally we have what we call what the media border of the sotarius muscle sotarius muscle the, the lateral side is covered by what the media border of the sotarius muscles. Then we have what we call the roof. We have to call the roof. And the roof is by what? The fascia lata. Fascia lata. Fascia lata. Fascia lata. Then the floor is covered by the adductor longus muscles, the pectineus muscles, and the ilio. Iliosus muscles. Yes. So again, superiorly, we have the inguinal ligament. Medially, we have the uh, media border of the adductor longus muscles. Laterally, media border of the sartorius muscles. On the roof, we have the fascia lata. Then on the floor, we have the adductus longus muscles, the pectineus muscles, and the iliosoas muscles. Iliosoas muscles. All right. So, of course, over here, we are looking at what? What should make up the upper margin? The upper margin. That means the superior margin or the superior border is covered by what? By the ligamentum inguinale. All right. An obstetrician gynecologist measures pelvis size of a pregnant woman. A caliper was used to measure the distance between two iliac crests. Two iliac crests. What measurement of the large pelvis was made? What measurement of the large pelvis was made? In other words, 
in all the measurements, which one of them is the largest or the longest? Okay, so this one you need to know which one. So we have to give you the range. So you will make the decision for yourself, anyways. Now we have uh, what we call the uh, how do, where do I even start from? So the conjugata vara, conjugata vara. This conjugata vara is made by subtracting the value conjugata externa, which is nine centimeters from the, how do you call it? The real conjugate, from the real what? Conjugate, real conjugate. Okay, real conjugate, of course. The real conjugate is about what? It's equal to 11. So if you subtract nine from 11, we have a two centimeters. So that means vera might not be the answer. Okay, now we can talk about the uh, conjugata externa. The conjugata externa. This is the distance between the mid upper and the outer pubic joint. The outer pubic joint and over the sacral fossa. And that is around 20 to 21 centimeters. You can write it down. 20 to 21 centimeters is the conjugata externa. Conjugata externa. All right. 20 to 20 centimeters. Then we have the distancia trochanterica. Distancia trochanterica. The distance is 30 to 31 centimeters. 30 to 31 centimeters. Then we have the distancia crestarum. 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 That is the, between the two iliac crests. Uh -huh. That is between the two iliac crests. And that is between what? 28 centimeters. 28 what centimeters. Then we have the distancia uh, spinarum. Distancia spinarum. That's from what? The spine. The spine. The spine. And that's between 25 to 26 centimeters. 25 to 26 centimeters. 25 to 26 centimeters. Now, the question here is that, uh, the question here is what? What is the distance between the two iliac crests, the two iliac crests. So what distance are they looking for? I just give you guys general stuff, measurements. But what is the distance between two iliac crests? Who can tell me? Two iliac crests. And you're talking about what? The distance here, what? Crystal room. Crystal room. room. That's the distance between two iliac crests. Two iliac crests. That is the measurement. That is the and what is the value? The value is what? 28 centimeters. About 28 centimeters. About 28 centimeters. So your answer here should be what? Should be D. Two iliac crest. So if you're talking about the spine, you are talking about the distancia what? Uh, spinarum. Spinarum, which is 25 to 26. 25 to 26. 25 to 26. However, the longest among them is the what? The trochanta. The trochanta, which is about 30 to 31 centimeters. 30 to 31 centimeters. But I think over here, even though they said what is the measurement of the large pelvis was made, they are still referring to what? The two iliac crest measurement. All right. That's what we didn't go for 31. 30, 30 to 31. That's what we didn't go for this one. All right. A patient has arterial hypertension. What long-acting drug from the group of calcium channel blockers? We'll talk about this. Calcium channel blockers should be prescribed. And of course, your answer is what? Amlodipine. Amlodipine is a calcium channel blocker and is used as a treatment for hypertension. So here, your answer should be what? Should be D. Amlodipine. Amlodipine. All right. A patient has been diagnosed with upper respiratory tract infection. Blood serum contains immunoglobulin M. What stage of infection is it? What stage of infection is it? Again, we've discussed this. So anytime we have IgM, IgM is an indication for what? Acute or primary infection. IgM. Acute or primary infection. Acute or primary 
infection and it's the first antibody to appear in response to exposure to an antigen it is the first antibody to appear in response to exposure to an antigen again immunoglobulin m immunoglobulin m and how do i remember this m because it is i would say it is the most abundant so anytime there's small infection it comes out first it helps me to remember it and of course acute means it's a severe condition so mostly it will come so for me that's what i use to remember it so yeah my answer is what igm so acute 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 condition for the three-year-old patient suffers from acute pancreatitis with a disrupted common bowel duct patency what condition can develop in this patient what condition so anything you are having uh acute pancreatitis and for that matter we are having about that patency what kind of jaundice are you looking at for who can tell me is it prehepatic post-hepatic or post is it prehepatic hepatic or post-hepatic kind of jaundice who can tell me mechanical mechanical also known as what post uh post-hepatic what jaundice we've talked about these things we've talked about them now in case of uh, breaking down of red blood cells. What type of jaundice is it? Hemolytic. Hemolytic, also known as prehepatic, exactly. Also known as prehepatic jaundice. Prehepatic jaundice. But what about in case of hepatocellular jaundice? What kind of jaundice is it? Oh, who can tell me? In case you're having a problem with the liver, what kind of jaundice is it called? Hepatic. Hepatic. Guys, these things should be on your fingertips. We'll talk about them. So your answer is what? It's mechanical jaundice. Mechanical jaundice. In mechanical jaundice, one key feature that you, you will know is that the feces is colorless or the stool is colorless. That's another thing that can help you. Of course, that's not the case in this question, but then just to add up to it. A patient has a tumor of the eye socket tissues behind the eye, eyeball. Disruption of accommodation and pupil construction is observed. What anatomical structure is damaged? What anatomical structure is damaged? So over here, we are going to look at for what? a ganglion. Ganglion. Because accommodation of the eye has to do with what? the ciliary muscles. The ability for it to contract and relaxes, isn't it? To accommodate far and near what object. So if this muscle is having a problem, what it means is that accommodation and constriction of the people will be what impaired. So over here, the anatomical structure that is damaged will be what the ganglion ciliary. The ganglion ciliary. And this is a parasympathetic what ganglion that is located behind the eye in the posterior orbit. And again, it is responsible for accommodation of the eye. And so therefore, your answer is B. Lymphocytes and other cells of our body synthesizes universal antiviral agent as a response to viral infection. Name these protein factors. Name these protein factors. And of course, you are looking at what? Interferons. 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 And these are proteins that are made and secreted by the cells of the immune system. Cells of the immune system. And of course, like I said, they basically deal with what? Viruses and things like that. Viruses and things like that like that so your answer here is what is interferons 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 so your answer is e interferons all right and interferons do not only interact with just viruses they can also interact with bacteria cancers and other foreign substances that invade the body so it's more general it can affect anything all right a patient consulted a dentist about a restricted mouth opening restricted mouth opening even without me continuing the answer 
the, the question, you already know your answer to be what? Of course, tetanus. Lock jaw. Lock this, a lock jaw. Lock jaw. And that is clinical or characteristic for tetanus. And now look at the detail. Analysis states that a stab wound of the lower extremity was there. What infection may have caused this? Now, there's no history of what? ATS or anti tetanus uh, injection for this patient. And that is why anytime people get wounded, immediately we give them what? ATS, that is anti tetanus serum, to prevent what? Tetanus from happening. To prevent tetanus from happening. So, in this case, this patient is having what? Tetanus. So, your answer here is what? C, tetanus. All right. A patient has damaged spinal cord, white matter, in the middle of the area of the posterior white colon, disrupted proprioceptive sensitivity of the lower limb, joint, and muscles. What fib fibers are affected? Now, if you have done your CNS very well, or if you know your CNS uh, very, 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 very well, you could tell that this is what, Fasciculus gracilis. Fasciculus gracilis. And don't forget, these are found in the, the spinal cord tract. You understand? And don't forget, the spinal cord is part of the central nervous system. Uh -huh. So, and then what? The gracilis, what? Uh, the fasciculus gracilis. The two uh, fasciculus that move together is the, the gracilis and the cuneatus. The gracilis and the cuneatus. Now, one deals with the upper part of the body, the other one deals with the lower part of the body. Now, cuneatus deals with the upper part of the body. It transmits information from the upper part of the body, that's the neck, the trunk, the arms. And the lower part of the body is controlled or it is by the action of what? The gracilis fasciculata. Gracilis fasciculus, sorry, fasciculus. The gracilis fasciculus. The gracilis fasciculus. So over here, since we are dealing with sensitivity of the lower limbs, the joint, and the muscles, definitely your answer should be what should be C, the gracilis, gracilis, gracilis. All right. In an elderly person, the change in heart force and the vessels' physical uh, properties were detected. They can be closely observed on graphic recording of the carotid pulse wave. What method was it? What method was it? And of course, over here is what? It's a sphygmography. Sphygmography. This is an instrument for graphically recording the form, the strength, and the variation of the arterial pulse. Again, it records the form, strength, and variations of the arterial pulse. That is the function of the sphygmography. The sphygmography in uh, uh, plethysmography, this deals with the changes in volume within an organ or the whole body. It deals with changes in volume. This deals with changes in volume. Okay. Now, uh, rigography records the changes in electrical conductivity. So this deals with what electrical conductivity, electrical conductivity of the body. Myography deals with velocity and intensity of muscular contraction. Velocity and intensity of muscular contraction. Phlebography deals with what? Venous pressure. Venous, or it records venous pressure. Venous pressure. All right. But over here, we want to look at the what? The changes in the heart force and the vessel's physical properties, which could be the form, the strength, the variation. And that's why over here, your answer should be B. Your answer should be B. All right. A patient has developed paroxysmal ventricular tachycardia against the background of cardiac infarction. What aromatic drug should be given? What aromatic drug should be chosen to avoid uh -huh, to avoid lowering the cardiac output? Lowering the cardiac output. And of course, you are going to go in for what? For lidocaine. 
you are going to go in for it for lidocaine or lidocaine lidocaine hydrochloride lidocaine hydrochloride and this is also what an anti arrhythmic drug which decreases the duration of action potential it decreases the action of action it reduces the action potential and how does it do that it blocks the sodium channel ions it blocks the sodium channel ion it is also shortens the effective refractory period and you know what the the refractory period is, is. it is the stage whereby no amount of stimulus can cause excitation isn't it now this drug will reduce that period for us it will reduce that period for us and again we also, we also use it in emergency cases like open heart surgery intoxication and myocardial infections we use them we use them so over here we are looking at d as our answer d as our answer